مرحبا اليوم راح نحكي عن الأفعال والأوزان درس ابتدائي This is an introduction to Arabic verbs particularly the present tense and finally we're going to start to understand how present tense verbs work We already understand it really well but this is going to formalize our understanding So يدرسو This is a verb All verbs are composed of a stem and affixes The affixes we're getting more familiar with, and the stem is just part of the verb. So we say yedrusu, tedrusu, edrus, uh, tedrusi. Those affixes that we add on to this tell us who's doing the action, but the stem stays the same regardless of who's doing the action. So our affixes will change and tell us who's doing the studying, but the stem will be pronounced the same way. The affixes stay the same across all verbs, so we could have a different verb. We could say, يروح, they go, أروح, I go, تروحي, she goes. The affixes will tell us what's being, who's doing it, and the stem tells us what's being done and how it's pronounced. يشتغلو, تشتغلي, right? We have the different affixes tell us who's doing it, but the stem, the pronunciation of the stem stays the same for all of those different conjugations. Yektubu, all these different verbs all take the same affixes. We've learned the affixes over time by just practicing it a lot in class, and in the book they give it to us give it to us in context. All these nice things that are highlighted in red are the affixes. Hold in mind that they always give these things to us as a verb. If you want to make a chart of the affixes with like a hyphen after them or a blank, go ahead. The book won't give that to you because it's just not as helpful. It's better to have some verb that you know really well, like bishtahl, that you can generalize to other verbs. It's good to have that internalized as a useful, meaningful piece of language. Notice that in fusha, some of these affixes, remember an affix is both a, a prefix or a suffix, and in, sometimes it's both, right? So, um, uh, tishtahli, right? There's a ta at the beginning and an e at the end. It's both a, there's both a prefix and a suffix. Notice that some of the suffixes in fusha have a noon in them. Don't let that throw you off. It's just a little extra thing in fusha that we're going to learn about later on. Another thing that's been a little bit confusing throughout um, learning Arabic is what about this weird ba thing? So we hear the word beheb, for example, biyashtahol, and then other verbs, they don't list them with a ba. In truth, all verbs in shami in a sentence should come with a ba. So, the ba is an extra thing. It just tells you this is the main verb in the sentence, and we're going to learn exactly what that means later on. But it's just sort of a default that goes on every verb in shami. And it goes outside of the stem and its affixes. So we can break this verb apart very nicely. We have our stem, shtahl. We have our prefix, our affix, our prefix in this case, ya. And then the ba is just this default thing that sticks on at the beginning. All verbs take this. Even when they don't list this in the, ver in the book, all verbs get this ba, as long as it's the main verb in the sentence. The only thing is that sometimes when they write the ena form with the ba, they write it in a very confusing way. So when, if we look at this word, it's hard to know what's the stem, what's the affix, and what's just the ba. So if we break it apart, we've got our ba, right? We know that goes on in the beginning. We have our stem, which we know because we have different affixes that are attached there. But what's this? There's no letter here. But really there is. This fatha is a sound. If we were to write this out in English, it would look very much like any other sound. It's just in Arabic we don't write short vowels. And this is really a short vowel sound, behib. It's not a long vowel sound. So we have our stem, we have our default thing, and then we have this weird affix-like thing. Well, I think that's confusing, and I think a lot of you guys have been confused because of this. So I will often write this with an aleph. The only problem with writing it with an aleph is that aleph normally represents a long vowel. It's not a long vowel, it's a short vowel, but this looks a little bit more like the fusha conjugation and other conjugations. So, I personally like writing it like this. Ba, alif, ha, ba. But it's not pronounced ba, hib. It's pronounced ba, hib. 
So find whichever one makes the most sense for you, for you understanding how everything else works. So affixes don't change. You have the same affixes for every single verb. There's a slight caveat. We're going to talk about that in a second. Stems do change, though, in the sense that every verb has its stem. This isn't to say it's, it changes as you conjugate it. It's just that for every verb, you're going to have to know what the stem is. Well, how do we know how to pronounce a verb that we've never heard before? And then if we do hear a verb, well, what's the important piece of information that we need to focus on in order to know what that verb's stem is? Well, there's good news. If you have heard a verb once, you can conjugate it for any set of people, any person doing it, right? You can say who's doing this. If someone says a verb to you as I do, you can be like, well, lahi, you do that? Because you've heard the stem. Even better news is that for certain kinds of verbs, there's a memorizable set of patterns so that even if we've never seen that verb before, we know exactly how to, how to pronounce it because we know that it's part of the set of, of verbs. The only bad news is you're gonna have to memorize what that set of verbs is. You're not gonna have to memorize it right now, but you should start, we're gonna start learning what it means. For every verb, there is a pattern. And this means that, and this pattern determines, like any other pattern in Arabic, our awzen, determines the vowels, extra consonants, etc., that are going to sort of have the um, roots slotted into it, like the video that we watched. Interesting question, of course, is why is this suddenly important? Well, we're starting to learn words where the stem is a little more complex than what we're used to, and that's going to start being a little confusing. So in the book, they write this word, bitzekar, in a slightly confusing way. It's glossed as I remember, but there's a ta in there, which is normally what we use for you or she, right? That's kind of confusing. Well, if you understand what kinds of stems we might see, it makes it easier to break it up into three parts. Our default ba, the a uh, or i, remember it's almost in between an a uh, fatha and a kasra, and then the stem of the verb itself, to zekar. This way, it makes it easier for us to see unusual verbs that we've never seen before and understand them. Now, I've mentioned this before. We've talked about this before on our verb consolidation sheet. We listed these as not real verbs. I call them pseudo verbs. There are some things that are not verbs. Do not let yourself get confused because you conflate these with verbs. The biggest of these is and, or bit, well, the word like and, andi, andek and bid, biddek, biddi. Neither of these is really a verb. They're more like a noun or a preposition. And for that reason, they take what the book calls the possessive pronouns. So they actually are, it's almost like saying my desire or his desire, blah, 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 biddo, his desire, or my having of a car or something, andi. It's more like that than it is like a verb. We translate them as English as I have, I want, but in Arabic they are not verbs and they do not act like verbs, all right? You need to know that or else you'll get very, very confused. Another one that's confusing is sekin. Sekin is actually an adjective, and you, you'll start to notice that when you see how we actually use it. Ena sekin, hua sekin, hia sekina, right? That temrabuda is just agreeing with hia, and the plural is sekinin, just like any other adjective. It's really like residing in. This person is residing in, the, the person residing in such and such. It's not a verb per se. There is a proper verb that's used in fusha in certain circumstances in shami, and this is just a very well-behaved verb. The stem is skun with a, a dhamma, and it can be conjugated like anything else. So you can see the blue box around that in the um, glossary. So we can break verbs down based on their stem. The most basic that the book tells us about is what we call form one. And we always use Roman numerals for this. I don't know why. We just do. So form one is the most basic of, st of forms and is totally unpredictable. What we're looking for when, we're, when we see a verb with form one, well, we're not going to see anything extra. There's no tas, there's no noons, there's no weird extra stuff on it. There's an aleph in the middle. It should just be three nice, simple letters, nothing fancy plus your affixes. 
The stem itself is only one syllable, which gets to the whole verb will be two to three syllables, right? Uh, yeshrub, teshrubi, for example, might be three syllables, teshrubi. But the stem itself is only really one syllable. You don't think about the affixes. The first stem letter always has a sukun. You always say yesh, yed, ya, right? It has a sukun. There's not an extra vowel there. That's really important. The second stem letter can either have a fatha, a dhamma, or a kasra. And you are not going to know which one of those is going to appear on a particular verb. So every verb just has to memorize how it's pronounced. All right? <clears throat> so we say yesh rab with a fatha, yedrus with a dhamma, and ya'arif with a kasra. A lot of you guys will misspell this in a way that makes me very happy. So I've seen a lot of people write yedrus with a long vowel there, with a wow, instead of a kasra. <clears throat> that makes me happy because I know that you know how to pronounce this word. You just got the length confused, all right? It should be yedrus with a short um, uh, dhamma, but when you write it yedrus, I know that you know that it's an u sound, and that's really important. You just have to memorize what that middle vowel sound is. But remember what I said, we're learning how to prioritize the important things. We know that we need to focus on the sound on the second letter in the word, all right, in the, in the stem itself, all right? So that vowel is really, really important. Form 2 is a really important form, as we're going to learn. And I like to remember it as Form 2 means you're emphasizing letter number 2. So what we're looking for is a shadda in the very middle of the word. Um, right on in the middle of the stem, on the second letter of the stem. All right? So we know the word yedrus to, st to learn. Yuderris is an example of Form 2. Yuderris. There's that... Shadda and ra, which makes it flap. Other letters are going to just sort of be pronounced sort of twice. The stem itself is two syllables. If this helps you, good for you. If it doesn't, don't. But it's da ris, right? Three syllables to four syllables total, depending on whether you have a suffix. So you da ris, three syllables. The first stem letter is a fatha, and the second stem letter is a shadda with a kasra. You de re, res. So we have a kasra under that shadda. So, we've seen yedrus means to learn. Yuderris means to make someone learn. Yeshrab is to drink. What do you think the word is? How do you think we'd pronounce the word for to make someone drink or to give someone something to drink? Say it. Try to say it. Guess. I'm going to give you a couple seconds here. Try to say it. All right, you either tried to say it or just sat there awkwardly in silence, which sounds unpleasant. To say, to give someone something to drink, it's that same pattern. You, deris, you, sharib, you, sharib, to give someone something to drink. Notice that this particular one in fusha has a U prefix. In amia, it's more like an I, sharib, sharib. Uh, is how I'd say that in Arabic, in, in Amiya. But this U, think of that vowel, that U vowel, is sort of part of the stem for Form 2, and then the affixes really do sort of basically stay the same. Form 3 is easier is easy to identify because there's an aleph in the middle of the word, and if you want, you can think of that Roman numeral 3, look at that thing, and see how this nice, like, clean line in the middle. That might help you remember which one is Form 3. The numbers aren't so important, but understanding what the stems are is what we're really trying to do here. So look for an aleph in the middle. The stem itself is two syllables, three syllables total, so you, se, fir. The third stem letter, depending on how you count, if you count the aleph, right? Se, aleph, fa, that one has a kasra on it, okay? You, se, fir. This one is easy to identify. You have that alif. Notice it also in fosha has the u, but again, bilamia be more like uh, yusafir. The meaning 
isn't quite as clear as form two. Form two very clearly has that make someone do something sort of meaning. This one is a little more nebulous. Form five, I think of having an extra t, so it's extra happy. What we're looking for is there's an extra t at the beginning of the word. There's a shed that also, just like form two, had that shed in the very middle of the stem. Same thing with this, the second letter of the root, the second to last letter of the stem here, right there, has a shed on it. The stem itself is three syllables, so it's longer, it's going to take longer for you to say this word. Four syllables total with the, the prefix, for example, ye, te, ve, kar. Don't let that te confuse you, because it can kind of look like the te for hia or enta. So yeta dekar is hua he remembers. Teta dekar is you or she remembers. Teta dekar. So notice that you have the two tes in a row. On the other hand, this one's really easy to pronounce. Everything is a fatha. Teta dekar, including the ya part of the beginning. All fatas all the time. Notice that that has that shed in the middle, just like form two. This is actually related to form two in terms of what it means. The resemblance isn't a coincidence, but we're not going to worry about the meanings too much right now. Finally, let's just talk about the past tense a little bit. The past tense works very much the same way as the present tense. You have a stem and suffixes. Notice that the stem does change a little bit in the past tense. It's a little more um, solid and staying the same in the present tense, but in the past tense, the stem does get a little bit uh, changeable, especially with words that have um, vowels in the middle in certain parts of the stem, but we're going to learn more about that in the future. The nice thing about the past is there are no prefixes, it's all suffixes. And, lucky for us, we've already learned the suffixes because we know the verb can. So look over there, can Let's just say it out loud again for practice. Kint, kint, kinti, can, can it, kinna, kintu. Well, we can actually separate the stem from the suffixes, and we'll have a sense of what the suffixes are. So there we have nice suffixes. Notice that the hua form does not have any sort of suffix in uh, spoken Arabic. In standard Arabic, it just has an ah sound. But this means that we can take verbs that are like ken, and we actually know a lot of verbs like ken. Uh, yeshuf, yeru, yaul, all these verbs are very much like ken, so they're the same as ken in the past tense. So we could say the verb for to go. Reht, reht, rehti, rah, rahat, rehna, rehtu, rahu. It sounds almost exactly like ken, except that we have a ra and a ha instead of a ka and a nun. Kint, kint, recht, uh, recht, uh, kinti, rechti, can, rah, canet, rahat, kinna, rechna, kintu, rechtu, kanu, rahu. Notice how nice these things go together. One thing we're going to learn is that for the forms two and higher, we can actually guess the past tense from the present tense, which is going to be really helpful later on. So in summary, all verbs are composed of stems and affixes. The stems vary between verbs. Each verb has a different stem, and sometimes in the past tense, um, the stem itself might vary depending on conjugation, but generally the stem itself stays the same. Then you change the affixes in order to conjugate the verb to say who's doing what the, ver the verbal action. Um, notice that the affixes are different between shami and fosha a little bit. And the most important part is that stems can be classified into patterns. Patterns, like anything else in Arabic, involve vowels and consonants that sort are of being added to the root of a word. The other important thing is that all verbs in shami take ba as the default. So even if it's not in your vocab list, know that you're going to be hearing those verbs with the ba in front of them. Finally, past tense verbs are also composed of stems and affixes. It's always a suffix in the past tense. There's no prefixes, so we can just say stems and suffixes, really. If you know one verb, you know the suffixes, but we're going to have to sort of learn a little bit more about how the stems work in the past tense.